Hello everyone and welcome to the Sydney Film Festival panel, uh, a virtual panel uh, quite fitting on the future of storytelling. This talk is presented by the festival and the University of Technology Sydney and if you've come in here via the Sydney Film Festival website you would know that we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, interactivity and immersive media and how that relates to storytelling. The all-star panel, well, all-star apart from me, includes Dr. Gregory Ferris, me, uh, futurist and inventor, Mark Pesci, the manifesto for virtual futures author, Ju Dr. Julia Scott Stevenson, and filmmaker, JJ Winlove, whose interactive film, Crossing Paths, which I spent a whole day exploring uh, the other day, at screens at the festival. So many of the technologies we're discussing today, AI, interactivity and immersion, are also embedded in how we experience our media today. So we're looking at how we experience these technologies today and in the future. One of the big questions for our panel is how such technologies might be used in our post-pandemic storytelling future. And I have a few opinions about that and I'm sure everyone else does too. I just would like, to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land we're on, a land where teaching, learning and the telling of stories extends back tens of thousands of years before UTS, before the Sydney Film Festival. And hopefully these stories will continue for many thousands of years to come after UTS and after the Sydney Film Festival. Maybe not, maybe we'll both be running for many thousands of years. I'd like to introduce our all-star panel apart from me, uh, Mark, and I'm going to do it in a, in a very inventive way, which is alphabetical order. Mark Pesci is a multiple award-winning columnist, professional futurist, inventor, and public speaker. Mark invented the technology that enabled 3D on the web, aka VRML, and founded postgraduate programs at USC and afters, Australian Film, Television, and Radio School. Mark holds an honorary appointment at Sydney University and hosts the podcast, The Next Billion Seconds, and This Week in Startups Australia. He has written several books in his spare time, most recent one being Augmented Reality, Unboxing Tech's Next Big, Big Thing, which is published through Polity Press slash Wiley. Our next speaker is Julia Scott Stevenson, who is a producer and curator of immersive nonfiction media a researcher in interactive factual media, the author of the Manifesto for Visual Futures, and in her spare time is on the editorial board for Immerse, an online journal that focuses on innovative and emerging non-fiction storytelling. She holds a PhD in interactive documentary and social impact, and is currently a senior lecturer at AFTERS. She was recently awarded a UTS Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship for her project envisioning and enacting that just climate futures through immersive media. Finally, filmmaker JJ Winglove is best known for writing and directing the Australian box office hit June Again, which came out earlier in the year, which stars Noni Hazelhurst, uh, Claudia Carvin and Stephen Curry. It was released in May and has literally just been picked up and I don't know how much uh, common knowledge this is, but it's been picked up for a US release in early 2022. He's also the writer and director of Crossing Paths, an interactive film that follows the lives of 12 characters over a day as their lives interconnect and is screening as part of the Sydney Film Festival 2021. Welcome everyone and thanks for being part of the conversation today. I wanted to start with interactivity because JJ, that's your big thing and it's the big thing for the festival. I'm working across multiple screens, hence I'm looking all over the place, mm -hmm. but I am looking at you right now. <laughs> um, and I wanted to just to do a brief overview for the Sydney Film Festival audience on interactivity. And then I just wanted to start with you, JJ, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Um, so we're going to start the conversation with interactivity and storytelling. Um, the Sydney Film Festival audience's most recent interactive experience might have been the Black Mirror episode, Bandersnatch, which was on Netflix a couple of years ago. 
interactivity has a long cinema, media and story history beyond, say, Choose Your Own Adventures, the storybooks of the 1970s. The most notorious of these interactive and immersive experimenters was probably William Castle. Um, some of you may, in the film viewing audience may know his work. He's best known as a producer of Rosemary's Baby, but he did a lot of experimentation with interactivity in the 1950s. Um, probably the closest thing to what we're talking about is for a film called Mr. Sardonicus, which had a punishment poll at the end of the film, or just before the end of the film, that allowed an audience to vote on whether the title character had a happy or sad ending. Um, because he was the, also a villain of the film, he, um, Castle never shot the happy ending. He always assumed that the audience would vote for the sad ending. With the rise of personal computers, artists and filmmakers started experimenting with storytelling in new ways, uh, assisted by applications by like Apple's Hypercard, Macromedia Director, that developed interactive nav narratives that combined media with interactivity. This experiment continues this experiment with interaction continues with Sydney Film Festival 2021 and Crossing Paths. Um, with this interactive cinema experience, viewers choose the story, following the interconnected paths of 12 characters through the streets of Surrey Hills on a sunny Saturday afternoon. JJ, tell us a bit about the film beyond what I've just said. All right, well, the, the way it came together was that I, um... I was, someone sent me a, a link to a, a grant that was, um, they were, they were going to give $10,000 to someone who came up with an idea for an interactive short film. And I hadn't really dabbled in that medium before. And so I started to go and research and watch a lot of uh, interactive short films, as many as I could find. And after about a week, I decided that it wasn't really for me. You know, I, I thought interactive films is, is some, stuck somewhere between the, the passive act of watching a, a linear film and the very active uh, act of, of playing a computer game and it, it kind of sat somewhere in the middle where you, I, a lot of those experiences I felt I didn't know if it was a game or if it was if it was a story and so I kind of backed away from it but I couldn't stop thinking about this particular idea I had for, the, for an interactive film which was what if what if it was just a story and it didn't matter which decision you made there was no winning or losing there was no right choice or wrong choice it was more of a, a way to explore uh, a group of characters and, and to slowly find out for yourself, you know, what, what was happening when that character walks out of, off the screen, you know, where are they going? Because um, normally you don't get that opportunity, you're stuck with one, one or two characters. And so I got very excited about that, that idea of, of uh, exploring that interactively. And so um, I just, you know, it's one of those things that I couldn't get out of my head. So I thought, well, I'll just have to do it and see if it works. And it was very much an experiment. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I wasn't sure if people would be, you know, uh, engaged or, or kind of bored by it um, but that also was exciting you know doing something that I hadn't seen before uh, and and trying something new and uh, you know it, it meant that I you know everyone who I got involved the actors and, and the crew were all very you know that same kind of frame of mind that let's just see see what happens with this and um, so yeah as you said that the story follows 12 characters um, they all cross paths throughout the course of a day and, and the, the in a um, when they uh, when they meet, you get to choose which character to stay with when they separate. So you kind of jump around between different characters, and you, and you get to choose uh, who who you follow and who you leave behind. How do how do we experience it at the festival? How does the audience interact? Well, the it was interesting the way this came about because um, it was designed to be a one on one experience that you. you engaged with on your computer and then when it came time to organize the cast and crew screening we're like well how's this going to work you know we want everyone there in a cinema but how are they going to interact so we had the idea of why don't we build a little app that everyone can have on their phone and then they can they can all vote uh, sitting in their seats they can vote using their phone and we created a little web page that captured the votes and then a host who was was me in this case set up uh, stood up the front of the beside the screen and I watched the votes come in and, and as they came in I kind of, uh, you know, I had this interaction with the audience where I told them, you know, well, it's neck and neck or, you know, we're definitely going this way with this guy. And it became, it, it, you know, we had, we didn't 
uh, expect it to be so kind of positive. It was, it became a real event. You know, people got very involved in the choices. There were arguments between different audience members and it became uh, a kind of a show in a way, which we didn't expect. And, and afterwards, so many people came up to me and said, that was amazing. You know, I've never experienced such a, I was so engaged with the story and uh, it was so much fun. So um, it was, you know, it, it happened by accident, but we will do the same thing at the, at the festival where we will have, uh, we have an app that, that the audience will hopefully download before they go in and they uh, will have the choice to all vote for the different uh, choices throughout. Yeah, I want to come back to why you chose to make the film this way, because it has elements of Robert Altman's <laughs> multiple character narratives. There's a bit of Rashomon in there in terms of unreliable retelling of stories. I just wanted to throw it to Mark and Julia, uh, what interactivity brings the storytelling and given its long history, I might start with Mark. Well, I, I, look, I, I feel as though JJ's put his finger on it. The fact that you get this unexpected engagement with the audience, you know, that's, we can call that the immersive barrier. There's this fallacy, the immersive fallacy that immersion is a headset and da, 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 it's not. It's when the audience is engaged. In other words, they've really, they've, they've, they've taken the hook and they're following the story and they're deeply in love with what happens next, right? And the interactivity here is presenting the opening you know, this is comes back to McLuhan's idea of hot and cold media, cold media where you actually fill in more of the detail, interactive media, you've really been given this surface to be able to explore. Julia? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I really like, JJ, how you've sort of happened across this notion that interactivity doesn't have to be the choose your own adventure story. That's kind of the first thing we turn to when we're trying to explain what we're talking about. But instead, rather than kind of finding the correct path through a story, it can actually be just a, an avenue for exploration. And you're exploring this existing world that you're not necessarily changing, but having that agency to do so, audiences can really love and get behind. And I also really love the fact that you kind of almost accidentally stumbled across it being a shared experience for the audience mm. and that for me really stands out as a probably underexplored element of interactivity and immersion the possibility to do it with other people and turn it into this kind of performative fun enjoyable experience that we all get to do together that's really exciting the other thing about it and you guys have just touched on it is the navigation when you navigate you usually use a map and for me JJ, your film, Surrey Hills, was one of the characters, almost like the 13th character. Mm -hmm. And you've now, you've, the, way I, the way I interacted with it was through this map-like device where you can click on a character and follow them almost like a path through and multiple paths. And there's, there's, a, there's a rich theory history in that sort of navigation, but you've added the other thing with, the, the mobile, using the mobile as the way of interacting. And one of the things about that is a lot of cinema experiences that are interactive, you would use a shared device. And obviously now post COVID, there's a hesitancy, just throwing it to any, uh, probably Mark, as a futurist, where do you see this type of interactivity or group interactivity taking place post COVID? Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're all communicating and interacting over a shared video medium right now. And this is one of the things that I think is a new element in the universe. Yes, these systems existed before, but now everyone's quite accustomed to them. And so there's a lot of space here for us to be able to interact at a distance. And so what we have, I think more than any one thing is what we now have is a real continuum where uh, an artist can decide which elements from this continuum they want to use to suit the audience's needs and the audience's desire to feel safe. Julia? Yeah, I think it's really interesting now that we all have these devices, these highly, highly technical devices in our pockets that allow us to engage in these ways that I think is going to enable a lot more of this kind of interactivity that gets around this idea of all needing to touch the same object. Um, I attended a, 
a similar um, project a few years ago, Choose Your Own Documentary, which um, when I was working with Antenna Documentary Festival in about 2015 was a big live performance and the audience voted, but they'd had to kind of craft these controllers that everyone in the audience needed to vote on. And of course, now we don't need to do that anymore. And as Mark points out, you know, the opportunities for interacting online are also really interesting. I produced a project this year called Privy2, which we ended up having to present over Zoom. And the interactivity from the audience was actually kind of being there and present and looking at the artist performer who was wearing an EEG monitor and simply having audience members looking at him that altered his brainwaves and the output of the project. So there's a we're now coming to this sort of space where we can use these much higher tech objects and it's not so complicated and it's not so scary and it's much more inclusive. And it's theoretical well it's not theoretically it's easier because we are all connected through these devices and through hyperlinks and through the ability to make editorial decisions as an audience on narrative and, and, and on story. JJ I wanted to talk a little bit about the technology you used to make it interactive and you use Shockwave Flash for yes. the yeah and as, as probably we all know, Shockwave has had some issues in terms of the technology being able to be used in the future. How, how can we as media makers future-proof these types of interactions and stories? Because there's a lot of stuff that I played in the 1990s that I can't play now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really important issue to to talk about actually because I think and it extends beyond just uh, storytelling and, and content I think um, you know I often think about family photos you know everyone has these di digital cameras of different ages you know from 10 15 years ago or five years ago two years ago now our phones and we have just mountains of data and, and, and you know I, I think we don't have you know a, a cupboard full of albums anymore we have all these disparate kind of devices and, and things and so I think it's the same with, with this kind of content that we have technologies that keep changing and they become um, redundant. And we, you know, we don't have a system of kind of porting them to the next technology. And I think that would just be too big a job to do every time technology changes or, you know, uh, I think it's, I think it's something we'll probably look back on this era and, and kind of rue the things that we've lost because of that, because we don't have those solutions, whether it's, you know, photos from this, you know, the last couple of decades that we took it, you know, on holidays and things, or whether it's content, interactive content or content that doesn't neatly kind of, uh, you know, be stored on, on kind of magnetic data or, you know, the, the traditional kinds of media that, that we have found a way to, to um, store and, and archive. Mark and Julie, you're, you're both content creators as well. Um, does this worry you? Oh, I, I recently discovered some work, early VRML work that I did. It was an executable file from 1995 for a very early version of Windows. To my surprise, shock and joy, it actually boots on a modern Windows workstation. Windows complains the entire time, but it actually worked. This is because Microsoft is actually paranoid about bringing their customer base along, so their products tend to operate. But all of the links to all of the content, everything else had expired. So I had to sort of go dig all of that up. And, you know, I've talked to curators down at Acme. Acme has some amazing original digital works that require machines that no longer exist. You know, so it's not even just that the format's gone, is that there's no computer to run these on. And so we now need to think about when we create a work, the artist and the people who are curating for the artist actually do need to think about the strategy. What does that mean five, 10 years from now? Julia? I think also we need to ask ourselves what what is it about a project that we want to capture so do we need something to be playable forever or might we want to draw on say the history of theatre I mean theatre has been dealing with this forever it's mm. ephemeral it disappears you know we don't always record those performances and there's a liveness in it and um, a texture there that we can't always capture and sometimes that's okay but I'm not saying burn it all down I certainly don't mean you know we need to leave it all in the past obviously we need to work really closely with archivists and you know uh, the National Film Board of Canada is doing really great work in kind of screen capturing and recording all of their old work that was done in flash and MIT is doing some of this too so that's all super important um, but our project Privy 2 that was live people have been saying to us you know where can I see a recording how do I get to this and and we're sort of saying well actually no the point of this project was you had to be there so we're not making a recording available we have one for our own purposes and archiving purposes 
fun, the point of the experience was was to be there live. So asking those kind of questions, I think, is important too. JJ, have, how are you planning to present this project in the future? Well, we're, we're looking at creating a, a web-friendly version of this uh, that, that um, can work online. Uh, the, the version that I, I built myself was, was just really a prototype. Um, and in fact, it was just going to be a little um, a demonstration version, but I, I got carried away and kept going till it was a complete <laughs> piece. Um, but the, the plan was always to then use that to then try and get um, get a web version of it built, which is beyond my skill set, um, and that we're in the process of, of trying to make that happen now. Okay, fantastic. I look forward to losing another day or two <laughs> uh, playing with the next iteration of it. Speaking of issues with te technology and playback, I wanted to move on to immersive. Um, Mark and Julie, I know, uh, and I'm, this is my, also my bag, and I have concerns about the way immersive and VR can be presented in the future, particularly in a festival environment. Mm. But when uh, for the general public who may be watching this, when we talk of immersion, we're generally talking about the sensation of being physically present in a environment. Um, but sometimes this is a sort of digital representation of that. So often we're immersed in a narrative experience of some type, kind. So the experience with things like VR might be limited to sound and vision, but we're seeing a lot of immersive narrative works that play with other senses as well, haptic sense, taste and touch. Um, Sydney Film Festival audiences are probably aware of immersion for the, through its VR hub, which ran from about 2016 to 2019. These sorts of festival experiences are tricky post-pandemic, um, but immersive does have a long history, a long cherished history, including technologies like moving panoramas of the 19th century, which was an audience experience, 3D films, um, other experiments with immersion like Cinerama. So these are audience experiences that require an immersive experience. What can immersion do with storytelling that traditional media can't? Yeah. And this kind of leads on to empathy. So I guess we'll go alphabetical with Mark. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't really want to go too deeply into the the what I think we're calling the empathy fallacy, the empathetic fallacy right now, because it does feel like that hand that putting someone in someone else's shoes will give them a sense of empathy with that person. It feels like that works some of the time, but not all of the time. But one of the one of the things I tend to look at when I look at fully immersive virtual reality works, which we're talking here, is how we're seeing the birth of a new language, a new cinema language, to use a term. And in particular, interestingly, I look at the transitions, because transitions essentially also define how cinema became modern, how we learn to edit and do montage and things like this. And we're now seeing those equivalents show up in the in in the immersive world and the thing is that those are in some sense the verbs for our storytelling right they serve to actually move the action along and so i'm looking at those there aren't many of them right now but several of the ones that i've experienced have blown my mind not to overstate them because it, but it, it, it there's just this sense of this something new that there is we're touching a new kind of storytelling or a storytelling that's so old we've literally forgotten it you know i don't know which it is but it's always great to see these new works some of which created by folks here in sydney creating these new verbs in this new language of immersion julia yeah, absolutely. I think we're, um, we are starting to get a handle on what that language is. And um, there is a kind of a new grammar emerging and there are editing styles that are being built, you know, for a long time in the early stages of this kind of third wave of immersion, people were saying, oh, there are no rules, we can just dive in and do whatever we like. And, and that's no longer true. You know, there are some rules emerging and, and people have started figuring out, um, how, yeah, and transitions is a, is, a, is a really great example. Um, and I think um, the some of the useful terms for me are also even moving away from storytelling, which might be a little bit scary for a film festival audience, but um, into things like story living and story finding. So some of the most interesting applications of this um, immersive media world involve putting you, the user, into a new world where you have the power to explore it yourself. And 
I mean, because we use often games engines like Unity and Unreal, they're not particularly well built for timelines. It, it doesn't work in the same way as our, as our previous editing systems. So instead of thinking of it as a kind of a linear form of time that we're exploring here, thinking of it as a space that we're exploring and starting from that point has been some of the most magical experiences I've had in, in immersive media. And you, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, well, Mark, you mentioned that there's a lot of Australian uh, makers in, in this, in this medium and a lot of really great innovators. I mean, Lynette would be Lynette. an obvious one in this instance. Yeah. JJ, what, did you ever, have you ever done any exploration in this area in terms of playing around? Because the, the film is very immersive in terms of exploration and in terms of finding, in terms of a sort of map environment. I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts about that. Well, I, um, apart from crossing paths, I haven't, you know, my only engagement with immersive media has really been as a, as a viewer and a user. Um, I mean, for me, it, and so I'll speak as, a, as an outsider, I guess, on this, um, but for me, I think what, what fascinates me about immersive uh, experience is that, is what it, how it engages the senses. You know, I think story has been around forever, um, as long as we have, long before film or, or um, you know, the written word. And I think, you know, that doesn't change, but what, what immersive experiences bring is, is more contact. And I think you, you kind of listed some of them before, you know, if, if we start to engage smell or touch, you know, those are new experiences. And, and that's what interests me in terms of how can we use that to enrich a story rather than to kind of uh, in lieu of a story. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I compare that to a play that's to, uh, told in a blank black stage with no, no backdrops and, you know, it's the, or a radio play, for example, that, that where it's the, really the theatre of the mind and it's still possible without any stimulus to, to get the audience to engage and believe they're in a completely different place with some real characters and a real story happening around them. So I think that's, that's an important thing to remember that, that story doesn't need that kind of uh, immersion and, and, and to engage every sense that we have. But I think when you can do that, I think it's really exciting to, to think as long as we kind of keep story at the center of it and whether it's, you know, linear story or, or the stories you talked about, Julie, the, the finding stories and, and those kind of things. I think um, when those things are brought together in the right way, I think it's really, really exciting. Yeah, I just wanted to go back Julia's comment about the, some of the rules that have been established in terms of creating stuff for VR and there are certain certain things like keeping a horizontal plane or not the camera not moving um, is there a is there a potential in storytelling to to play with that and to try and push that in such a way that it has a physical experience in in the viewer um, it's a, oh, that's an interesting question. There's a really great piece written by Jessica Brillhart, who is a sort of a leader um, in this area. She's an immersive director and filmmaker, and she's been doing this for years. And she talked about how one of her early 360 pieces that she was trying to edit and sort of on paper and on her computer, it was looking fantastic. And she was doing these beautiful cuts and then she put it in a headset and she was just horrified by how awful it was and how, you know, the cuts just didn't work. Um, it just threw you out completely out of the space. And then instead of doing a coming from like a linear editing format, she started editing in circles and in um, forms of attention. So she, she calls it like matching for attention. You know, you finish a shot looking in one direction. Well, it makes sense to then have the viewer still looking in that direction for the next um, image that appears, for instance, if you are even cutting between images. And there are some people that suggest that you probably shouldn't do that either. So um, if you want to mess with the rules, of course, it's always fun to break rules, but you really need to know what they are first and, and, and play around with how they do work before you start chucking them out the window, I think, because it's, I mean, there are some things that I've come out of where I've you know, really needed to throw up at the end of something because they've messed with the kind of the balance and things like that. And that's not really what you want from your audience when they come out of the end of it. Just like filmmaking, you've got to know the rules to break the rules. Exactly. Mark, I see you're pretty keen to get into this. Well, I mean, Julius hit it on the head because 
in this medium, and particularly the more immersive a medium is, and particularly the closer a medium comes to the body, and we're talking about something like a headset, you're talking about something that's literally applied to the body, the more access it has to our sensoria, and therefore the more sensitive the creator has to be, they have to hold you and they have to take care of you in that position. And if they don't, because they don't know what they're doing, they're going to hurt you because they don't mean to, but they don't know enough to keep you safe. And if they learn a lot, then they know exactly how to put you in peril, but at the same time, keep you safe. And it feels like we haven't quite gotten to that point yet. But the kind of VR that I could do and create when I was in my early 20s is the kind that would immediately make me motion sick today as someone who's almost 60 now, right? And I know that a lot of immersion is designed for effectively an 18 year old boy who has capacities around what they can tolerate for motion and motion sickness that are far greater than almost everyone else in the population. And so part of that first lesson that we actually need to learn here is that when you're dealing with these immersive media, you're dealing fundamentally not just with storytelling, but with the body and the body's ability to exist in that story. Exactly. And, one, and the, there is the common in, misinterpretation around immersion as the future of all storytelling, but it's really suited for short form and casual experiences, isn't it? It is very taxing. And so you're always weighing that how much commitment does an individual have and how much do they have inside of them before they are overtaxed you don't want someone leaving an artwork feeling sick i mean unless that was your intention that's not what you want julia yeah absolutely i mean it's just another form of media and there are so many wonderful and amazing forms of media out there and there absolutely is no suggestion that immersion is the one prime form that we are all aiming for. And it has very particular features that make it suitable for certain things like the exploration that we were talking about before. And it might not be the best way of presenting certain stories that are absolutely meant to be in 90 minute feature length on a big screen or in episodic TV series, for instance. So figuring out what that is and um, as Mark said, you know, it can be really intense and it uses your whole body. Well, I mean, the really good ones do use your whole body. And so thinking through what that can be for and why, why you would do that are probably some of the key questions. So I'm going to jump to AI um, and just as a sort of background to it. And JJ, I'm interested to get your opinion about as, as someone that uses media as well as makes media in terms of... Um, how you might approach it in the future. But for, for the lay person watching this, um, artificial intelligence uses computers to perform tasks that, are required, that previously required human intelligence. So it would use algorithms to classify, predict, act, and learn from the data that, or data that the computers are given. And the idea is that it would improve over time. Um, the SFF audience would experience would have experienced this mostly with curation of their digital content, I'd imagine, what they see in the social media, what Netflix might recommend to them, what ads YouTube might place in the videos that watch, uh, the phone that's listening to them that starts sending them emails about certain products. Uh, for media practitioners and makers, a lot of us have been using AI for years, especially in post-production and things like visual effects for crowd simulations, uh, more recent technologies like Adobe Sensor and cloud computing to speed up processes like speech to text, uh, reframing of content for different platforms, saying going from a feature film to social media. Uh, we're seeing an attempt by, to get AI to take on some more creative aspects of storytelling, which is kind of problematic some of this is comical, some of it's opening up ethical cans of worms. So things like animating still images to swipe face swapping uh, to writing scripts. There's some very funny AI scripts out there. Anthony Bourdain's documentary Roadrunner, which is just about to come out, recreates Bourdain's voice reading from letters that he never actually spoke, which I find incredibly problematic. Um, I guess the question is experiments in AI and storytelling uh, becoming increasingly sophisticated and invisible in terms of 
re whether they're real or not. Um, is the panel concerned about AI being less transparent in media making? And again, we'll do it. We'll do a reverse alphabetical order. JJ. Uh, I mean, this is such an interesting area because you know I, I think until very recently you could see when when computers were involved or when when technology was involved you could see the little border around it. Whereas now it's possible for the audience to have no idea that that what they're watching has been manipulated. That the person that's talking to them is not does not exist, or that the voice they're hearing uh, is, is a person who's no longer with us. And I think it'll probably be a while before we, and maybe we never will have an idea of, of the ethical, uh, you know, whether that's ethically okay with us or not. I think um, the only way we can find out is to try these things. And um, I, I think when it becomes really questionable to me is when the audience isn't told uh, that, that they're tricked um, by the use of this technology. And um, I think that's ethically very questionable. But when, when it's done in the spirit of the story that's being told, and in the spirit of the people that are that are being used or, or a part of that story, I think um, you know I, I'm, I'm excited about where it can go and what we can do with it. I mean, I remember as, as a kid imagining that one day Humphrey Bogart will be back um, when the technology um, it becomes uh, catches up with us, and, and you know I feel like that time is now. You know that that we can we can bring back those old stars, and and is that okay? Is that you know um, would they want that? Who knows? I, I think um, this. Every, every few weeks, there seems to be a new question that's being asked by what, what's now becoming possible. Julia? I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Greg, by using the word transparency. And I think trust is also a really important um, concept here. And consent, we really need to talk about consent when we're discussing these kinds of things. Um, there was that pushback against uh, the Amy Winehouse tour. There were some suggestions they were gonna use a hologram of Amy Winehouse and send it on tour. Obviously, she was never able to consent to that before she died. Um, the Bourdain example is also really interesting. You know, you might be able to say, oh, look, it's just a really innocuous example. But each of these things kind of chips away at the bigger picture here. And we need to have those conversations quite explicitly. Some of the best work I've seen that uses AI and, and deep fakery is, um, is using it to demonstrate what some of the issues are. So in Event of Moon Disaster by Fran Panetta and Halsey Bergen is a fantastic piece that recreates Richard Nixon's speech after the moon landing, um, but based on the other speech that was made in case it all went horribly wrong. So it is the real text of the speech that he was prepared to read if the moon landing didn't go well, and they've created a deep fake of him, old recordings, him now reading that speech. And that kind of approach is sort of fascinating because we all know what happened. We know it's not real, but it looks incredibly um legitimate so i think going back to some questions yeah consent trust and transparency are going to be the key elements in how we take this forward gradually well unfortunately julia we are not going to get the gradually we want the gradually but we won't so greg as if it, almost in an example of perfect timing overnight a friend of mine in america mailed he downloaded a new app for his phone and this app takes old damaged photos and using sophisticated AI machine learning, re-reses them, basically turns very, very low resolution, old photos into high resolution, crisp, almost hyper real photographs. And he took a series of photos that were anywhere between say a few years old up to photos that were 70 years old. One was his father, when his father was a soldier in Korea and showed this incredible thing. And this was all being done again on his smartphone. It wasn't going up to any server anywhere. And so you now have this interesting line where in fact, these technologies are coming at us from so many directions simultaneously that it becomes the time to have a conversation not about highlighting a particular instance, but to think about what it means now to be situated in a culture where AI is continuously operating on almost all the things that we see and hear. I guess that's a kind of, well, interesting, optimistic, but kind of depressing in many ways. Uh, way to sort of start to wrap up things up for the for the talk today i just wanted to get one more thought from each of you in terms of the human voice in storytelling and this goes back to the original brief for the for the talk are, are, with these technologies are we losing that human touch with 
AI getting better and better at it. And I'll, I'll do, I'll go back to alphabetical order for this, Mark. So as someone who has actually done screenwriting, one of the things you learn when you're screenwriters, there's all these great software tools that help you do screenwriting. And as someone who also works in technology, I've been watching what's going on there. And earlier, I think in June, a company called GitHub introduced a product called Copilot. Now, GitHub is a, a website that's used by programmers to store code, all right, and to edit code and to share code around. Copilot is essentially giving you an AI to look over your shoulder when you're writing code. Now, that's actually good because it helps you correct errors, but it can also make recommendations on the right or wrong way to do things. Now, they haven't released this to the broad public yet because all of a sudden, again, people who think about where these lines get crossed start to ask interesting questions about that. But I can easily see within the next five years that that class of AI will now get blended into a screenwriting tool. And people will now have a pair of screenwriter, and the other part of that pair is going to be an AI. And we'll see an interesting effect on the way we tell stories as AI becomes more deeply threaded in the creation of those stories. Julia? I do have some concerns about the potential strengthening of filter bubbles in this space. So using things that we're already seeing, like recommendation algorithms, just feeding things back to us that it thinks we want. And so kind of removing the possibility for spontaneity a little bit. In terms of creativity and human production, I'm quite excited about the possibilities and the partnering possibilities, as long as we are clear about um, that interaction and that partnership there. But I'd like to choose to be optimistic and think about how we can use this in speculative ways about building positive futures, about how, I, how might we use these incredible tools to bounce off our own creativity and kind of create fascinating worlds that could be possible ways forward that fix some of the really like dramatic problems that we have in the world too. JJ. Well, I, I think the, you know, we're, we're constantly, the, the, our toolbox is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, every week there's a new tool that we can apply to our content or storytelling. Uh, and I think it's really up to us to, you know, as, I think as long as we're in control of those tools and they're not in control of us, I think that's that's the most important thing that we you know that we have to to keep happening is that we we use these to tell the stories that we want to tell, not that that these things tell us what the stories are. And I think that's when things start to get a bit scary. But I think audiences will will decide that. You know, I think new technologies come along. You know, you look at three D came and, and it went, um, and it may come back again. But I think you know audiences will always tell you what what works for them and what doesn't work for them and i think you know the technologies I, I often think of when digital music first came along synthesizer music and there's a period of five or ten years where music that kind of music was just terrible you know because it was new and everyone was playing and trying every single button they could get their finger on and so for a few years you know we we had terrible music in that in that field and eventually people kind of built it into their, their creative, uh, you know, tool palette and, and they started to create beautiful music with it. And, and now I think it's, it's, it's as valid as any other type of instrumentation, but, it, but there is that period of, of kind of getting used to new technologies and learning how to apply them in a way that, that you, you master and you, you have control of rather than it kind of dictating where you take, take the story. Yeah. I mean, my, my main concern is the, is this curation that, you talked of Julia and what we're missing out of in terms of of the the ability to properly browse and I think we're losing the, the ability to browse with with AI particularly with things like streaming services and and social media and JJ one of the things I loved about your film was the, that I could I, I didn't whilst I had an overview of the map I could choose the, the, the way I would navigate around the streets of Surrey Hills and the, and the journey of these 12 characters. So I, I thank you for the experience of that. I do need to wrap it up. Uh, Mark, Julia and JJ, if that is your real first name, I, I do thank you so much for being part of this panel. I, I have had a blast and hopefully the SFF audience um, have enjoyed it as much as I have. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.